Hi, and welcome back to Columbia Physics Preceptor Television. Today we'll be talking about polarization and interference of light. As you hopefully learned in class, you know that light is made up of waves of electric and magnetic fields oscillating through space. Now last semester during the waves lab, we learned that there are two different kinds of waves. Transverse waves, such as light and ocean waves, and longitudinal waves, such as sound waves. You'll recall that light is a transverse wave. So it has uh, electric and magnetic fields oscillating perpendicular to the direction of travel. So as light travels in this direction, the electric and magnetic fields oscillate up and down and back and forth. We can say that a wave has a certain polarization if one component of its oscillations is in a particular direction. Since magnetic fields are sort of trickier to deal with, usually the point of reference for light is the electric field. If an electric field for a light wave is oscillating in one particular direction, say up and down in this case, so in a time t naught, it'll be up, and then as it oscillates, it'll go down sometime later, but it only stays in this up and down direction, we can say that this light is linearly polarized. Now linear polarizations can exist in almost any different angle. We can have light that's linear, linearly polarized along this direction if it has no component of the electric field oscillating in the up and down direction. We can also use something called a polarizer to choose what direction our light is polarized in. Most of the time, uh, light that's generated by, say, incandescent lights or fluorescent lights is unpolarized. It has components of the electric field going in just about every direction in equal magnitudes. If we put this light through a polarizer, the polarizer will choose one direction for all of those uh, electric field vectors to travel in. But as it does, It'll also reduce, if we have, say, a polarizer here in the up and down direction, it will also reduce the intensity, or it will reduce the magnitude of those electric field vectors, in effect reducing the intensity of the light. If this initial unpolarized light has some intensity I naught, we know that after passing through one polarizer and becoming linearly polarized light, this intensity, let's call it I1, will be one half of the original intensity I0. After this, we can do some fun things with this light. We can put another polarizer behind it at some different angle. You might remember uh, the addition of vectors can be done using the tip to tail method. We can also decompose vectors in this way as well. If we have, say, some polarized light at an angle like this, so that its electric field is oscillating back and forth in a slightly diagonal direction. And we put a polarizer in its way that selects the up and down direction. If we decompose this vector, this electric field vector, into component vectors, one in the up and down direction, and then one in the perpendicular, say, left-right direction, this polarizer will only select this vector. It will block this component of the electric field vector so that the result after, one polar or after the vertical polarizer is light, again, linearly polarized, but in this case, instead of being oscillating at a diagonal to the vertical, the electric field will oscillate exactly vertical. But you can see that this vector is slightly shorter than this one in magnitude. So any time you put polarized light through a polarizer, it will reduce uh, the magnitude and the intensity if the polarizer is at an angle to the original axis of polarization, or the original direction of polarization. This relation is called Malice's Law. It says that for an intensity I naught, the intensity after one polarizer will go like cosine squared of the angle between the polarizing direction 
and the original direction or the original axis of polarization of the light. What you'll do today is try to confirm Malice's law. You'll start out with an unpolarized light source, run it through one polarizer to get polarized light in an arbitrary direction. Then you'll run it through a second polarizer at some other direction and measure the intensity using a photodiode. What you'll be able to do is manipulate the relative angle of those two polarizers and then take the cosine squared of the angle and see if there's a one-to-one -one linear relationship between the intensities as a function of the angle. The other experiment that we'll do today looks at another property of the wave nature of light. <clears throat> this is double slit interference. Whenever we have a source of light, it's putting out, in this case, linearly or polarized light where the electric field oscillates up and down like a wave. <clears throat> Normally this wave just propagates through space, but if you put things in its way, such as a screen or, or a small opening, uh, the light will bend and uh, diffract in different ways. It will also interfere with itself. Uh, we know that if you put two waves next to each other, a phenomenon called superposition will take place, where the effective wave is the sum of the amplitudes at all points in space and time contributed by those two waves. What we can do in this case to observe this effect is put two very small slits in the path of the light. In this case, instead of an incandescent light, this will be a laser light that you'll be using. Using uh, Huygens' principle, light will then propagate out of these two small openings as independent waves that are both in phase and traveling along in the same, in, in almost all directions. Interference will then take place between these waves as they meet at different points in space and as we observe at a screen some distance away. And we'll call this distance, say, big L. In order to see interference, we need to have some prediction for how this light is going to behave. What we can do is look at the lengths of two lines emanating from these small openings out to a point on the screen. What we want to know is how will the light interfere with, uh, how will the light from the two different openings interfere at this point on the screen? In order to do this, we need to know what their phase difference is. Remember, if two waves are perfectly aligned with each other, to say in phase, if we add these two waves together, we'll simply get a wave with the, same, uh, with the same frequency, the same period, but with twice the amplitude. However, if the waves are exactly out of phase, that's for every crest, there's a trough, and vice versa, these two points will add up to zero, so will these, so will these, and in effect, every point along the wave will add up to zero. So you'll have zero intensity at that point instead of twice the intensity of the original light. What we'd like to do is predict where we have constructive interference. This is where the waves are in phase. In order to do that, we need to look at the path difference. How much farther does this, this ray of light travel than this ray of light? To do that, we simply draw a triangle at the very beginning near the two openings and we notice that the hypotenuse of it is little d. We can control this simply by selecting the proper set of openings. The path difference between these two, if this L is very, very large compared to d, the path difference just ends up being this small bit right here, which, using properties of right triangles, we can say is d sine theta. For constructive interference, we want this path difference to be equal to an integer number of wavelengths so that the crests and troughs still line up with each other and we get constructive interference. In that case, we can set this equal to m lambda. Now, 
In order to measure this phenomenon, we're going to be moving a small detector along this screen here out at a distance L. What we can do is measure some, call it uh, distance x up to this, uh, up to this point where we're measuring the interference. We also know that this triangle here, its tangent of the same angle theta is equal to x over L. Now, when L is much, much larger than D, we know that sine theta and tangent theta are almost exactly equal. So we can equate these two, we can equate these two together, and we end up with an expression uh, for actually the distance between subsequent minimum here, or subsequent maxima, pardon me. <clears throat> Any maxima is going to be separated by a distance delta x, or a change in x, where you're going to find different maxima, the different bright peaks along uh, this screen where there's constructive interference. The expression for the location of those, delta x, is simply going to be that delta x divided by L, the distance of the screen, is equal to lambda, the wavelength of the light, divided by D. By measuring these delta x and L and D, you should be able to figure out what the wavelength lambda of the light is. Uh, one safety note for this experiment, since we are using lasers, uh, lasers can do damage to your eyes if you stare into them. So please do not reflect the laser in, or, or shine the laser in any way which might reflect into a person's eyes. Uh, that's about all I have to say. Have fun. <laughs>